was we were we wanted to do a we wanted to do a portfolio prep course. I was going to do it. Um, I've helped a few of you um, offline and, and tried to navigate it. Look, we all know it's a super clumsy process to try to get your portfolio prep together. It is one of those final steps before you can sit for your final exam. So you have to do this this portfolio prep, and it's it's old, antiquated. It repeats itself. It's a little bit clumsy. And I had assembled a whole bunch of material, and I was going to do this, but I had the pleasure of getting to know Evelyn really well over the last couple of years. And she talked it out there. Well, I can help you if you need it. And thank God she's doing it so I can actually kind of observe as well. So with us today is Evelyn Ward, CCIM and Vice President with Trans Western. Um, she is a CCIM educator, which once again, for me, is, is the huge bonus here that um, she's going to be able to help us uh, walk us through this, this presentation. Um, for those of you who don't know, and we're, we're getting some marketing together to put this out there. For those of you that don't know, um, well, let me back up. Each year, the CCIM Institute holds two, call it larger meetings, the spring governance meetings and the fall conference. I'm sure I'm not getting their names exactly right, but the spring and the fall meetings are the big meetings. They bounce them all over the country. And they, try to, they try to make it even for everyone and try to do the different travel. Thankfully, New England chapter in general has done a great job at getting to know a lot of folks within the Institute, like Evelyn and some of our leaders, our presidents, our, our Institute presidents and, and executive board. And it just kind of made, they started just paying attention and they thought, wait a minute, we've never taken any of our meetings to Boston. What do you think? Can we come to Boston? And of course, for us, it was a no brainer. Of course, we'd love to host it. So if anyone has been to any of the of the of these meetings, they're you know anywhere from two to three hundred, maybe more CCIMs, and it's all about the the um, uh, networking, but it's also the the, um, the all committees get together, um, and you learn a lot about the institute and how chapters operate and function, and it, it's a great opportunity experience. At the beginning of those are usually when the CCIM. Well, actually, oh no, none of you have been there. The, the beginning of those are when they do the final exam. So for a couple of days, uh, the candidates are there doing their course review, then they sit for the final exam. And then if uh, once they pass, they can participate in the meetings that are happening um, during those few days. So that being said, um, the Institute is coming to Boston in April of 2023. So that's really exciting because it helps everybody really save money. Um, instead of you guys having to fly around the country and go to these things, there's an opportunity for those candidates that are really close to being able to, to get their pin to try to tighten up the rest of what they need this year, the remainder of this year, and just a little bit into next year, um, to try to sit in Boston to earn your CCIM designation. So that is huge. That's huge, huge news. We're working on marketing, um, and that includes regional marketing. We're letting Connecticut Upstate New York and New York Metro um, also uh, understand that we're going to be in Boston. There's already a hotel block. It's April 15th to the 19th. Um, it's not available, but I'm just saying that's we have a the Western Seaport is our, our hotel location. Everything will be happening there. If you're going to sit for the final um, in spring, you will be at the Western Seaport and we will see you there. So there's a lot of excitement. It's also over Marathon Monday weekend and Sox home opener. There, it's going to be crazy. That being said, we brought this together so people could start saying, okay, what do I need to do? This portfolio takes a little bit of time. And as, in addition to your coursework, we've got to get everyone squared away in the portfolio. Locally, I have been willing to help people as they reach out. And once again, here we are with this course. So uh, enough rambling out of me. I want to hand it over to Evelyn. Oh, by the way, she's in Houston, Texas. Um, and she's, she's done a lot of these and she's spun up. So I'll stop rambling. I will hand it over to uh, Evelyn and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us today and I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the invitation from the New England chapter to do this. I'm really excited uh, to be able to share my experience uh, as a grader actually for portfolios for the last seven years uh, and be able to provide you tips so that you can get past the first time. Some housekeeping items. Right now, please hit your mute button. 
The other housekeeping item is you may have questions that come up as I am going through this presentation. I do have time for Q&A at the end of this uh, presentation and would re respectfully request that you save your questions till the end and we can get through them. If it necessitates a longer answer, uh, we can connect afterwards as I am available to provide you with the best chance of success on your portfolio, okay? All right, next, uh, I, I, don't, I think Dave did a really, really good job of reinforcing this, but I wanna just give you personal experience. Being able to take the test in your region or really close to your home is an awesome opportunity. This has not happened. We have not hosted these meetings in Boston in 50 years. So this opportunity likely is not something that's going to uh, come up uh, any anytime soon. And uh, I, I would highly, highly recommend that you do it. When it was hosted in Austin, Texas, back when I was president of my chapter, we were able to designate uh, almost 30 plus people from the region. And it was an awesome opportunity. Hopefully you guys can also attend a regional dinner so that you can network, make some money. Isn't that why we all take these courses, by the way? So please make sure that you mark your calendar in how to, uh, in, in making sure that you can submit by April. So we'll talk about some dates that are important if you want to sit in the April exam, all right? So next, I wanted to point out a couple of upcoming courses that are scheduled in or nearby New England. Um, uh, one thing to note, this is a big misconception in the candidate world. You do not have to complete all of your courses by portfolio submission date. I'm going to repeat that. You do not have to complete, have completed all your courses by submission date. What date do you have to complete it by? 30 days prior to the exam date. So sometime in, I believe, mid-March, you have to have all your core courses uh, accounted for. Okay, so so don't be deterred if you're not finished by January, um, but but make sure that you have everything lined up because if it comes to 30 days prior, they will cancel your sitting at the exam. Okay, so uh, look on the calendar, see what else is close by. Always great to travel uh, in the U.S. because you can make some really good contacts um, outside of your your immediate market. All right, after this presentation, you will uh, be very knowledgeable about the requirements for your designation. You will know the important dates in submitting your portfolio. You will understand the volume requirements for the portfolio and decide on which one you would like to meet. Further, and probably most importantly, you will know what is a qualifying activity and what is a non-qualifying activity. You will also know the different portfolio options that we have available to you. And finally, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the online portfolio portal. I want you to write this down, take a picture of it, a screenshot, whatever. This link right here is the single most important link uh, for a CCIM candidate. I believe your chapter actually sent it out as part of this uh, meeting request. This is the uh, uh, quote unquote ultimate guidebook to the portfolio handbook. If you ask me a question that can be answered in this portfolio handbook, I'm going to refer you back to this handbook. All right. Almost every question we get can be answered. Uh, those that can't, we will talk you through. But I will want to make sure that you have uh, really exhausted what's in the handbook before you come to us, uh, or me rather, or even your grader uh, regarding your question. You can also Google CCIM portfolio handbook. It's the first one that pops up. All right, so coming into the portfolio, it's good to know the different types of folks that are designees. Uh, typical top of mind is broker, agent, investor. Also somebody who specializes in leasing. Uh, we have plenty of asset and portfolio managers. We also have corporate uh, folks from the likes of PwC, uh, different banks. Uh, we see a, a whole slew of folks that come through the 
portfolio or the CCIM designation process and can get their designation. So it is open to uh, a very inclusive opportunity. So what's good is once you identify your specific profession, then you can follow the guidelines and especially the qualifying and non-qualifying activities to match that up and make sure that you can be successful there. All right, so here are the requirements. First and foremost, you need to become a candidate of the Institute. If you are not one right now, you need to sign up. If you sign up right now, they will prorate your dues for the rest of this year. And if you plan on sitting in the April uh, designation um, test, excuse me, in Boston, then you will also need to be a candidate through next year. You need to have a minimum of two years of full-time commercial real estate experience from the date of portfolio submittal. We're pretty uh, strict on that, by the way. So if you are not going to be two full years from the date of portfolio submittal, that will kick you out. So make sure, regardless of what exam you choose, that your date of submittal uh, does have you working two full-time years. And we are also strict on the full-time. Going to school, taking a break uh, doesn't count towards that full-time. Again, as I mentioned, complete all of your four core courses, but that does not mean from the date of submittal. As I mentioned before, it needs to be 30 days before you take your comprehensive exam. And at least one of those needs to be an instructor-led course, which means live, in person, in the flesh. You need to complete eight hours of negotiation training. This is called uh, CRIN uh, online or in the classroom. It must be completed prior to taking 103 or 104. Highly recommend the classroom. You get a lot more out of it uh, than online. Online, you're basically negotiating against yourself. How fun is that? Complete two electives. We uh, talking about electives. So going back up here to becoming a candidate of the CCIM Institute, you get one full elective credit for a solid year of candidacy from the date of your submittal. So if you have been a candidate for 12 months from that date, then you get one elective credit. What else counts as an elective? The course concepts review. So that is not a required course. I tell you that the pass rate of the folks who decide not to take the review course is not nearly as high as those that do. So very much worth your time. That counts as a full elective as well. Ward courses count as electives. If any of you took foundations, that also counts, I believe, as a half elective. So you can refer to the, uh, the schedule underneath the, how to become a a, a designee on the CCIM website for what courses count for what. Uh, what this course is all about, submitting your portfolio. And then finally, you have to successfully pass the comprehensive exam. I know some of you, uh, or uh, you may know folks that went through the fast track program. Uh, the fast track does not have to submit a portfolio, but they do have to pass the comp exam. You may also be a university alliance student. Uh, that means that you uh, you test out or, or are exempt rather of taking three of the four courses. You do still have to submit a portfolio of qualifying experience and pass the comp exam, by the way. All right, uh, misuse. This is a biggie that uh, we encounter oftentimes. And uh, as a candidate, you can only use your candidacy or mention your candidacy in a resume to a prospective employer or broker. We are looking at changing that for LinkedIn purposes, but for the time being, this is where you need to stay. So uh, only putting it on a resume to uh, an employer or broker. When should you submit your portfolio? Uh, first of all, you can uh, submit your portfolio at any point during your candidacy following completion of CI 101. I definitely encourage you to start compiling the information that I'm going to share with you. Very important that you keep that all organized and not scramble to the last minute. Finally, the uh, portfolio deadline. It's the last date that portfolios will be accepted in order to allow sufficient time for the graders, as well as getting to the comp exam. And we'll talk a little bit about that timing, by the way. And I mentioned this already, start compiling your portfolio once com you have completed 101. Really good dates, take a picture, write them down, whatever. Remember them. 
First, if you plan or would like to test this fall in Chicago, these are important dates for you. Your portfolio is due July 29th and the exam registration deadline is September 9th. We as graders are going to meet towards the middle to end of August. We have 30 days to work with you in order to sign you up for the exam. And uh, one note here, the CCR that I mentioned is virtual and it's October 3rd through the 6th. And then the important date is the comp exam on the 13th. Where the next really, really important one is up here. And that is your portfolio due date. If you wanna sit for the exam in the spring of 2023 in Boston, needs to be in by January 13th with an exam registration deadline of March 17th. So make sure that you put this on your calendar and start on it now. Do not wait until you are at the end of the road. All right, one uh, really important PSA, another really important PSA, all of these are really important, but I would argue that it's probably one of the most respectful PSAs that I'm gonna give you, which is a recommendation. So. Depending on which track you choose, you have either one to three recommendations. You will always have a chapter recommendation regardless of what track you select, okay? You can ensure ticking off your chapter recommender if you wait till the last minute to request their recommendation. So put it on your calendar well in advance of that either January date next year or July date coming up real fast and reach out to your chapter recommender. Uh, and I only put it for uh, uh, the next slide gives your chapter recommender. So I apologize uh, for New England only, not for Connecticut. But you can, if you've already started your portfolio, there is a list that is easy to find on who are approved chapter recommenders. If you decide to not reference that list, then we're gonna kick your portfolio back, okay? Uh, again, please, please be a good steward to your chapter at volunteers, if you will, and, and give them plenty of time. Your blank recommendation forms, by the way, are located on the portfolio portal, um, and I'll show you where those are. All right, I mentioned this. I, was, uh, I only showed the New England folks that are approved to write chapter recommendations, but again, Connecticut and anybody else can find those on the portfolio portal, but these are the two for New England, Wayne and uh, Jeremy Serio. Okay. Uh, let's talk about volume requirements. So first and foremost, any transactions that you decide to submit must have been completed in the last five years from the date of portfolio submittal. Again, date of portfolio submittal. So the three ways that you can qualify. One is three or more at qualifying activities totaling 30 million or more. Notice I said three or more. Or you can do exactly 10 qualifying activities that total $10 million or more. Again, that's doesn't have to be exactly 10 million. And then finally, the uh, 20 qualifying activities regardless of total dollar volume. So any one of these qualifies as meeting the portfolio qualifying activities, okay? An important definition of what a qualifying activity is, it's a completed or closed commercial real estate transaction that you material or participated within. Uh, the last five years. So material participation is you played a large role, a, a pivotal role, et cetera. You were not just observing from the side. So we really want you involved in each of the activities that you submit. All right, let's roll through what a qualifying activity would be. First, we have our sale, our purchases, or our exchange. It must involve a recorded deed and the value is based on closing price. Next, we have a commercial real estate lease. It has to be at least 12 months or longer. The value is equal to the total base rent due. A note about this, if your lease specifically states what the estimated triple net charges are for a triple net lease, you may utilize both the base rent and the triple net charges, but that needs to be very clear in the lease. And my recommendation is, as you, if you are submitting the lease backup documents, 
highlight it and make it easy for your portfolio grader to find those details because it will go a whole lot faster. All right. Residential leases do not qualify. Renewals also usually don't qualify unless you submit traditionally, uh, as we'll discuss what that means, um, or, and, or they are, uh, and you submit traditionally, and there is a substantial change in that renewal. So we're not going to look at something that's simply an extension of term um, and, uh, and, and, you know, a, an increase in lease rate. So it needs to have something significant, contraction, termination, blend and extend with, with more nuances involved. Next, we have commercial real estate development. Really important here. It has to be completed. I have to have a completed development because the value of that development is based on the sale of the property or a third party appraisal. Commercial mortgage financing does count as well, but you must be a lender or mortgage broker. So if you are, are, are pulling out a loan for your own development or your own property, that does not count. Also, first position loans are, are only um, qualifying. And if you plan to submit a refinance as a lender mortgage broker, you must submit a traditional portfolio. We need to see a lot more detail on the refinances, similar to a renewal lease. Second, we've got commercial real estate consulting, obviously a growing field. This has always counted, but we have to have a signed third-party consulting agreement and a full copy of the consulting report and proof of payment to you. We can also count commercial appraisers, appraisals by commercial appraisers. We also have a track, which I'll talk about, about for uh, active asset managers of CRE and real estate advisors. Uh, they must make at least uh, half a million in fees. And then we have our non-transactional professionals. So these are our asset managers, corporate real estate executives, large commercial organizations, folks that oversee either a large portfolio of property or transactions and uh, dollar volume really doesn't apply to them. Now they have to have been in the business, by the way, for five plus years. We'll talk about that. Really, really good to know. This is exactly verbatim for from the portfolio handbook. All right. These are non-qualifying activities. If I were to call your attention to anything in the next two slides, I would tell you that the most common mistake that we see is people trying to qualify property management duties as part of not of their qualifying activities. Uh, land with sales of less than, than four single family unimproved lots. Um, we also see secondary or underlying loans of commercial real estate quite frequently. And then we see um, also uh, residential investment uh, leases as, as non-qualifying, as well as pro uh, project management and construction work. Unfortunately, at this point, that does not count towards the designation. So that you, you'll need to find something else to, to submit or substitute in its place. We talked about this earlier, uh, as far as it goes with the qualification and the material participation, you have to have a substantial vol or involvement with the transaction. And it must be of a commercial or investment nature. All right, let's talk about the three different tracks that you can submit for the portfolio. By the way, everything's online. Uh, we got rid of paper a long time ago, so thank goodness for that. So uh, regardless of which one you choose, uh, you will need to fill out an application that is uh, blank and downloadable on the portfolio portal. You will have to craft a professional resume up to the date of your portfolio submission. You will have a summary of your qualifying activities. This is a template spreadsheet you download from the portfolio portal. You will have a signed and notarized affidavit from a managing broker or your supervisor or your CPA of each company you have worked for. This is a really important uh, note here that we have been seeing as a problem for our candidates of late 
is that you can't notarize your own affidavit that says you worked for that company. All right. That just doesn't work. So if you are work for yourself, that's great. Get a CPA, your CPA to substantiate your involvement. You also need a detailed explanation of your roles and responsibilities. We get the question of what's the difference between my resume and my roles and responsibilities. I like to think of it as your resume is a view from 30,000 feet and your roles and responsibilities dials into the micro or the everyday details of your work, okay? And then finally, that chapter recommendation that I've already mentioned. Let's get into the different portfolio tracks now. First one is Streamlined. Streamlined is only available to the professionals who have been in the business five or more consecutive years in uh, from the date of submission, all right? Required contents are what I mentioned, the application, the resume, your summary of qualifying activities, your affidavit, your roles and responsibilities. Here's where it changes. You need three letters of recommendation. You need one from a CCIM designee who is not related to you and who does not work in the same firm. You need one from a client, someone whom you have worked for in a professional capacity, again, cannot be related to you, and your local chapter rep, which we discussed. Streamline non-transactional. You can read the, the sentence here, but the gist of it is they are working on large portfolios. And it doesn't make sense to detail out those in a, in a qualifying summary. So what we allow them to do is submit under this non-transactional. It requires that it is a significant upper role uh, within a company uh, with five or more years from uh, your portfolio submission date. So I need you to be managing either 10 or more individuals um, or responsible for a significant portfolio. So uh, we, we have had issues with folks from smaller firms and uh, we've asked them to change to a streamlined transactional. So these are just some uh, some de details of what needs to be met in order for you to qualify for non-transactional. Uh, and just a note, I, I apologize, you need to be supervising 20 or more commercial agents if you are a managing broker in order for this to count. All right, for your non-transactional, uh, it's all that you've seen uh, before, but uh, here's where it changes. You need a company org chart, and then you need those three recommendations that I just mentioned for the previous transactional one, all right? So company org chart needs to show you in it and everybody else uh, around you. And in some cases, we have asked for multiple charts to not only show their immediate team, but also how that person relates back to those above them. All right, traditional. Traditional is anybody who has had less than five years, but at least two years, okay? So the... Uh, the same contents we talked about previously, application resume summary, and here's where it changes. An activity data form is required for each activity. That is a blank form that's downloadable on the portfolio portal and filled out by you. You will give, uh, it's about a three page. It, give, it asks for the parties to the transaction, uh, details on pricing um, or, or uh sale price rather, and as well as your specific role and what your client was looking to achieve, okay? And the more detail you put in there, the better chance you have for passing the first time, okay? Don't do the, don't do de minimis because your portfolio grader will, will put you on the spot to finish it out. And then finally, you also have to provide a copy of a closing settlement statement to legitimize that the property was either sold or it was leased, okay? So the, the transaction was consummated. Again, a note here, uh, three, and three transactions that require you to use the traditional option, renewals, refis, and investment income properties. And I will just, just a note here, Residential in investment income properties is the requires a whole lot more information when it comes to submittal. So I would highly encourage you to shy away from submitting these type of properties because of all that's required. There's tax returns. There's a whole host of things that are that are a part of that. 
You'll also need that verification of employment that we talked about. So for each, each qualifying activity you submit, you have to require not only proof that it closed, but you also have to require two proofs of material of your material participation. So these are just some examples of material participation that can be done. Um, one of those, if you are, are tough on uh, finding materials that show your participation, you can have a notarized statement from a client or supervisor that states that you materially participated in said transaction with the address showing for that transaction and make it easy for your grader, okay? But uh, listing agreements are great. Contracts are great. LOIs are great. Um, uh, email, we even take email if it's got substantial dialogue about the transaction, okay? And then finally, that recommendation that we talked about. Uh, you've seen this about three times now. If, if you uh, make the mistake of submitting uh, renewals or uh, financial analysis or refis or residential income properties, in a streamlined, it will be kicked back. You can, you can count on that, okay? Uh, and residential income properties of five or more automatically qualify as a commercial real estate transaction. So those are your multifamily transactions and you can submit them in a streamlined portfolio. And again, just a PSA about non-transactional. If any of you are thinking about doing this for your, your portfolio track, I would encourage you to reach out to me to make sure that you qualify for that so you don't go spending time on it uh, when a grader is likely going to have uh, trouble with it. So uh, I, I do give my contact information at the end. So feel free to email me because we do want your, to have the highest and best chance of success at first blush. And this is a good e email for you to know. It's designation at ccim.com. That's our staff person. Uh, she is fantastic. Her name is Lynette. And she handles quite a bit of your questions. Um, and when she can't answer them, uh, our portfolio graders do, folks like me. All right, let's look at what it looks like online. For those of you who have not yet ventured onto this website, uh, this is where you can go in order to start your portfolio. Highly recommend you do it ASAP if you haven't already. Um, you'll log into your CCIM account and then uh, you'll log into this portfolio one. It's the same username and password you use for your national account, uh, CCIM login, by the way. All right, uh, you'll start out, you will pick your portfolio track that we have already discussed. You will start your portfolio. And these two boxes will appear on the right-hand side of the portfolio portal. What it will show you is what you have completed so far. So the set agreement just means that you have signed up for the, uh, for instance, the streamlined portfolio. You have also picked which test you plan to take. Uh, portfolio application, this shows that this particular person has not uploaded it yet. So again, this is a blank form you download. Roles and responsibilities, that's something that you type into a dialogue box. So this person has done that. Resume is something you create, you upload. And then those supporting documents, those are all the things we talked about for our traditional folks. They have got to uh, submit the evidence that the deal's done, consummated, plus two material participation proofs. And then finally, recommendations. Uh, a note here, you may not see this as complete when you submit your portfolio. That's okay. Your recommenders are not going to send you the recommendations directly. They're actually going to send them to that designation email that I mentioned earlier. And then uh, these are the other milestones. So as I mentioned, you cannot submit your portfolio if you're not a chapter member. Uh, we do have to receive payment for the review of your portfolio. And these are your other recommendations. Uh, again, if you're traditional, you're only gonna see chapter, but if you are streamlined, either transactional or non-transactional, you will see these three. So these are all the details I talk about. That's that set agreement where you put your info, pick your portfolio tract and where you're gonna take it. Oh, and great news here. All of my required education coursework, including the online ethics course, will be completed 30 days prior to the CCR and comp exam, which I have stated multiple times now. 
Where do you download the blank form? So anywhere that you see this above a choose file dialog box that's highlighted in blue, that is a link that takes you to a form you fill out. This is the dialog box I mentioned for roles and responsibility. This is the resume you create and choose file helps you upload it. And then when you're done, you mark each section as complete. This is a view of your uh, of a of a draft application for particularly for streamlined. It's three or four pages, I believe. Fill it out. Please don't leave blanks. We've already talked about resume. All right, your forms for recommendation. They're located at the bottom of the portfolio portal. They are also blank forms. Again, it's that blue link I mentioned earlier. Oh, and here's a really good, I, I had mentioned or, or shown rather the two folks from New England chapter that are approved for the uh, chapter recommenders. And right here in the click here, that shows you a complete list. Okay, so uh, look to that. And then uh, your portfolio submission fee is $175. I believe that may have gone up slightly. So don't keep me to that. Um, but you will, uh, you'll, you'll upload everything and then you'll have the click here to remit the portfolio submission fee. And then that will automatically put you uh, in queue to be reviewed. All right. It's August 22nd, if you are submitting for fall or it's uh, February 15th, 2023. And you get back a notice that you have been disapproved, okay? Number one, don't freak out. The important thing to note is that we are here as your graders to get you designated, all right? So don't freak out. Also try not to get mad at us. In the email of disapproval, it's going to tell you exactly, exactly what you need to do in order to get approved. All right, so we are going to detail that out for you, tell you what's wrong, tell you what needs to be changed, and we'll give you 30 days to make it right. If you can't get it right in 30 days, then you will have to move on and submit for the next one, okay? Approved and incomplete lets you still register for the exam. So approved is self-explanatory, you're off, hoorah, and if you follow these guidelines, that should be you. Incomplete, however, means you're missing something that's minor. Maybe there's a signature. Perhaps there's a recommendation that's lingering. That's not on you. That's something that we feel confident if your other materials look great that we don't have to wait for. Okay. In some cases, if you're missing all of your recommendations, especially for a uh, streamlined, uh, streamlined portfolio, we're likely not going to approve it. And we're going to ask you to bug your recommenders. Okay. And uh, we will back. We will open up, by the way, your portfolio portal again, so that you can resubmit these items. That, my dears, is the end of my presentation. This is my contact information, and I don't give it to you uh, as a farce. I give it to you seriously, so that if you have questions, I am happy to help you. Again. I tell you that I want to see as many designees as possible. It is a joy to see this group grow and be able to interact with a whole bunch of different practitioners. So please do not hesitate to reach out. If you have read that portfolio handbook and you feel like your question cannot be answered. All right, now I will take any questions. I think the best way to field it is probably to type it in chat and I can answer them one by one. Evelyn, I got a question generically, um, and I might ask, I don't know how challenging it is, Bernadette, to give me a screen share option. One thing that I found, Evelyn, and like I said, I've, I've helped a few people, a couple people on this call, um, I've helped them navigate the process, and, and my biggest complaint has been the process is just so challenging, right? There's, there's no one link to follow, that gets you where you need to go. It's this link then provides a different link and, you, and you, you keep chasing these links. And I found that to be very cumbersome. And I had created a Word doc um, 
a one page word doc where I highlighted what all of these links are. And so I, I have a word doc that has all the links in case someone's getting lost in link chasing. Is that somewhat still the case? In other words, if you say, yeah, maybe, then I could put my word doc on the screen if it helps people, especially where this thing will be a recording that they can refer to. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt. And I can, uh, you can kind of walk through how your system, I don't know that we changed, you got designated what, four years 18. ago? Yeah. 18. Okay. So um, I don't know that we've changed it significantly from, from that point. So yes, I mean, if you want to do that, I, I don't think it hurts. If, uh, can Dave, you can go ahead and share your screen. Good. Is that on there? Did that work? Yep. Okay. So, oops. All right. Of course, I can't do anything else. But, uh, and likewise, I'm happy to send this to anyone. Um, and, and it seems kind of basic in nature. But once again, it, it once you get into this, it can be overwhelming because you you think you'd, you'd like to go to one spot and get all the answers. It's, it's not necessarily that way. Now, the good news, um, once again, and Evelyn can attest to this, is we have just invested, the Institute has just invested a significant amount of money into fixing a lot of this. Um, it's gonna take about a year and a half, unfortunately, but they've, you know, and, and I'm talking, you know, multiple millions of dollars to fix all the back end of this. So that's part of what happened is that it kept getting add on, add on, add on. And that's what created a lot of these links that, that don't have all the information. So obviously the homepage, um, a basic, you know, earning the designation, um, one of the education components and then the designation curriculum and then the elective credits, right? That's something that sometimes confuses people is there's elective credits that sometimes people don't understand until the until near the end and it feels frustrating that my god I did all these courses I spent all this money what do you mean I need a quarter credit or a half credit of elective so once again I kind of bundled these under education to make sure you're seeing all of these um, the portfolio as we're discussing now who can submit and what those look like how do I submit um, and then where to submit. <clears throat> and then of course, information on the exam. I'm only guessing that's still a, a link that works. Some of these may but, or may not work, Yeah, but it does. That's, that's pretty much what I put together. And I am happy to share with anyone, or if you see this in a recording and can follow, well, however it works. Um, Bernadette, is this something I can send to you and you can simply push to everyone that registered? Absolutely. All right, why don't I do that? And here's, um, here's one thing I tell you, Dave, is, yeah. is You've got, you, I could probably combine um, almost like three, like I could combine sure. one, yep. Yep. four, five, and yep. that is what you would find in the portfolio handbook. So that's yep. the link I gave. Yep. And then that's, that's one place that you can, that is candidate lives. And then yep. the second place a candidate lives is underneath that designation. So the one that's got, um, uh, designation slash so anything ccim.com slash designation that's another really good place to live because yeah. that will give you dates uh describe you know that elective credit so that's really really good okay. for for two places that will have the bulk of what a candidate needs the first is that port well probably the first is the designation link and then the second one is that portfolio link okay and, and like i said i purposely I purposely was redundant in a lot of this because as I recall navigating, once again, it was that, well, wait a minute, I'm in this link and then it tells me to go to a different link. And then I'm in this link and it tells me to go. So yes, this is redundant, certainly. Um, and that's why I did it. It's just to really pull out each piece, just give a note in case someone's on the fly trying to figure out where they were to get that information. Awesome, okay. Uh, yeah. Let me answer some questions. So uh, you guys have come up with some good questions. So thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I answered it in the chat, but I worth repeating. Uh, have questions about managing broker requirements to have 20 realtors working under you? Yes, yes, uh, is in the affirmative. You have to have a minimum of 20 brokers working under you. Nicole uh, mentioned that she sells a lot of multifamily properties. 
uh, she asked me to clarify what is needed for the residential income properties. Uh, if you are talking about residential income properties of less than five units, uh, I would refer you to the portfolio handbook. They, it is detailed information on exactly what you need. You need a tax return of the buyer. You need a tax return of the seller. Um, you need uh, the leases that correspond to anything below five units. So it's a, it's a very cumbersome process and uh, it's, it's detailed out line by line in the portfolio handbook. So start there. Uh, you ask, are five plus units automatically accepted? Yes, five units or greater automatically count as a commercial transaction. All right. Um, I'm going to let you read the portfolio handbook on your last question there because they're, they're line by line items. Jesse says, one of my colleagues cannot make today's call. Uh, I believe Bernadette is going to send a link to the recording, but I'm going to let her chime in on how she wants to handle that. Yes, I'll send a recording out to everyone that has registered, whether they attended or not. Thank you. Very kind of you. Jack brought up a great question. So Jack's question is, how is confidentially confidentiality handled? I work for a public company and some of the details of my transactions represent material, non-public information or information where my company is otherwise sensitive to sharing. We've been here before, uh, number one. And number two, I would tell you that the greater is bound by confidentiality. Uh, once your portfolio comes in the system and is approved, all of that information is scrapped. If there is really, really sensitive info, um, you can certainly black some of it out. What you can't black out though is those finer details that legitimize you know, the, the, uh, the size of the transaction, especially if you're submitting for a certain dollar volume, by the way. And we have to, you know, understand that the uh, who the parties are to the transaction. And, but if if you are filling that out, please note to your employer that uh, number one, we as graders are bound by confidentiality, and number two, me being from Texas is never going to see any transactions uh, or grade any portfolios from candidates who are within Texas or surrounding states. So we try to really keep a buffer there. Um, and again, if there's if there's issues that are, you're coming up across and uh, within your company and they don't want to release any of those, shoot me an email and I'm happy to provide them with further details and even even talk to a manager there. I think you'll find that when you tell your manager what you're what you're going for in the CCIM, that uh, that there that there will be uh, not as much resistance there to to giving us those details. Okay. Um, Judy came in. I am working with a cannabis cultivation client. Are there any regulations with accepting this as a transaction? No, I would assume there's not, uh, by the way, so, so no, before I swallow my words, there is not any restriction for that particular transaction. Uh, we just need to see how you used it. So is it a land transaction? Are they building a facility, et cetera? So just understanding the nuances of it, but no, it's not, uh, it's not uh, legal. Okay, so land transaction, you're all gravy there. Uh, I'm going to give about another minute for questions, and if there's not, then um, I just want to thank you for being a part of this. I uh, I will be in Boston, uh, uh, PSA. I spent about four years there, my first semester in college outside of uh, Boston and Waltham, going to Bentley. Uh, it has a soft spot in my heart, and I can't wait to see our CCIM events there. I can't wait to see you guys get designated either in Chicago. I'll be there too. And um, this is this is a labor of love, by the way, to be a portfolio grader. But I will tell you, it is really cool to see the folks that come through. And uh, CCIM is exactly what you put into it. So if, if you um, put in cool things in your, or a lot of hard work in your coursework, you're going to make money with it. And it's the same when you network with your fellow CCIMs. Um, you have legitimacy right away with this designation. So I hope that uh, that to see you very soon. And I hope this was very informative for you. Evelyn, before you go to, I wanted to just elaborate just a tad more. For those of you that don't know, I kind of uh, made an assumption. We are, we as the people hosting this are the New England CCM chapter. Within the New within this area is a region, right? So we're, we're the New England CCM chapter is part of region 11. Region 11 includes the New England CCIM chapter, the Connecticut CCIM chapter, upstate New York 
CCIM chapter in New York Metro CCIM chapter. So four chapters are in Region 11. You, you get the visual. Um, we're hosting this, but I think it, it, I think we're able to get a few folks from Connecticut in here as well. And we, while Evelyn flashed a few upcoming core courses and courses that will help you um, check off any boxes on what you need to submit your portfolio and to uh, participate in sitting for the exam, I also want to let you know that we're also trying to tweak some of our offerings a little bit between the region, right? We realize the opportunity of having the Institute come to Boston is a big deal, right? It could be exciting because you could be very local to, to family members that might be able to participate now. And once again, it's less expensive for you to stay in a hotel and not have to fly than everything else that's included with having to head out. So that being said, we're going to try to get some more education out there that's going to help. We New England had a, 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 a mix up with our 101 and we, we ended up having to cancel that. Um, which I think would have just been now. I think it would have been June, May or June. So we had a mix up there, but we're gonna to try to look and see what we can do between the region. So we might have other courses that are available in the region. And once again, if you're looking at it and you're thinking, hey, I might be able to get this done for April, 2023. Yeah, it might be worth a drive to, I don't know, Rochester, New York or something. It's not necessarily ideal, you wouldn't think of it, but it might be easier to just drive up. Hey, I drove to Pennsylvania uh, a month after I took a, I think I did 103 or something. No, I did 102 in, in Medford. And then I said, the hell with it. And I drove the next month, I drove to Pennsylvania to take 103 because I wanted to get it done. And then I flew to Maryland for 104 a couple months after that. So I crushed it and got it in. That was just my choice. But I tried to keep my travel as limited as possible. So if we can get things sprung up that you guys need in the region 11, then at least we kind of limit some of your travel. And in New York State, New York Metro, I should say, New York Metro really doesn't have a lot of courses they offer. So it's really New England, Connecticut, upstate New York and, and what might you know uh, happen around there. So once again, um, this knowledge from me is simply coming as, as the um, you know regional vice president of region 11. Um, certainly your chapter leaders can help guide you into what's really available, but I'll, I'll try to help do what I can to to get some more stuff going and, and help answer any questions. And if, you, if there's courses, you guys, if there's enough of you that need the same thing, maybe we figure out how to just make it happen for you because it, it would be great to get you guys pinned in Boston if that's an option or certainly sooner or later if, if that's the case too. So I wanna say thank you to Evelyn. Um, Michael Chase, I know you're on the line. I don't know if you have an opportunity to, to unmic or unmute and say hello for anyone out here. If not, that's okay. And I certainly just wanna take a chance uh, to thank you, Evelyn, for your time. And, and try to be available for anybody that, uh, that has questions. And truly, you guys gotta understand what, what you hear Evelyn saying, I've gotten to know her quite well in the last couple of years. And, and it's, it's not just because she's on this call. I mean, she is that generous and that eager to help make sure that this is a smooth um, uh, transition to go from a candidate to taking the test to becoming a CCI. And so she's that passionate and truly does care. So certainly let us know if we can help. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank y'all. Have a great weekend. That'll do it. Oh, Thank you, everybody. Evelyn, uh, can I have a quick question, please? No, uh, sure. Oh, is it, if it's a 20 transaction, in the, is also count as uh, less than five family that uh, include dollar volume, that's single family or multifamily? Uh, you can submit it uh, within the 20 transactions, but you have to go traditional route and you still have to meet all those individual requirements that are out outlined in the portfolio handbook. Yep. Sure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, thank Paul, you. do you have a question? No, I think it was a wave. Oh, it was a wave. Okay. No, no. Oh. actually, I did have a question. Okay. Um, I, I was taking the CCIM classes like in the 1980s and 90s. Um, and I, I'm, I, but we used the calculators, the HP 10B2 and stuff. Um, do they use computers now or can you still use your calculator? Calculator. Um, Paul, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can use your calculator. I would, I would highly suggest Paul that you take refreshers of all the courses that you took back in the eighties. They have changed the content significantly. Um, some of those, by the way, you don't have to take the cumulative exam on, so you can just audit the class, um, which honestly, I, we, we actually had an individual about um, 
two or three years ago who um, whose age will not be shared. <laughs> But he, uh, he took them a long time ago and he struggled to pass. And in fact, he never passed. And I don't want that to be your experience because so much has, has shifted, um, not only in the you know real world, but also in our curriculum. So you can audit those classes. Okay. You, you will still have to pay the fee, but you won't have to take the final exam. But my suggestion is you do that. Because getting to the CCR or that course concept review and not having seen all the new material, it, it, it will be an uphill climb. Um, I, I have actually taken seven courses, 101, 201, 301, 401, yep. 405, Back when it was, 103. Yep. yep. Uh, but like I said, it's been quite a few years. Yeah, it has been a long time because that's when there were seven of them. So, right, so my suggestion is, Go, go back, definitely do 102, 103, 104. It wouldn't hurt for you to do 101 as well, but but for sure you need to get in the 102, 103, and 104. Thank you. You're welcome. But you, you will be able to use the calculator. Yes, but yeah. I, I think you'll find that you like the, the laptop a lot more. They, they want you to bring your laptop because that's what the, that's what they're working off of now. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.